Hey, Brooke. Hey. Can we, um, I'm going to do a little test run here to see if I can get this video. Okay. I'm running it on a different. You're not in your office, are you? No, I'm at the carriage house. <laughs> oh, okay. Which is where I've been working from mostly now. I should have recognized the slanted ceiling after spending that much time as I did there. <laughs> All right, can you see anything? Or yep, I... I, yep, but it's not playing and it's full screen, so it's good. Okay. Oh, you know what I need to do is I need to... <sighs> oh, you have to click the box. Yeah. I think you have to stop. Yeah, you have to stop sharing. And when you do share screen, click when you, that screen comes up. Share sound. Yeah. And we'll optimize for video clip too. Whatever that does. It's got to be good. Sounds good. What? It says to share your computer audio, please install the Zoom audio device. Oh, I've never heard of that. Let's try it. All right. Are you seeing it now? Yep. Hi, I'm here with Dr. Mark Sorrells of uh, Cornell and University. And I can hear it too. He's professor of yep. plant breeding. Okay. Seems to be, seems to be playing pretty good. Not jerky or anything, can hear the sound clear. Okay. We'll stop that for now. If for some reason it doesn't come out right, I'll let you know. Couldn't hear you there for a second. Can you hear, say something? Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, my. Yep, I can. My sound switched to the other screen. Or the other <laughs> monitor. I will. I'll let you. Yeah, I'll let you know if I can't hear it or if there's a problem. Yeah, sounds good. And if it doesn't sound like you hear me, then I'll text you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Let's see, 
Ryan's been given this a couple of minutes, probably before the after 3.30 to get started. We'll give it a couple more. I haven't made it to my beverage of choice yet. I'm still cleaning your things off the list. <laughs> Now's your chance. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm quite there yet. Uh, All I have is an empty mug. But it's a John Deere mug. You had to buy a tractor to get that. I don't know. I think that probably it was some family member that saw it at a store that thought, oh, Brooke would love this. Oh, John Deere mug. <laughs> Dr. Freed. Hey, Ross. I guess I need to unmute, huh? Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah, how are you doing? Not bad. I thought I'd, I'd check in with Mark. I I think I met Mark about 40 years ago. <laughs> well, I, one challenge with that is that we have a recording of Mark today. And oh, so okay. <laughs> we don't actually have Mark live, unfortunately. But well, you've got Dean and I, so I don't know if that's, that's any true. Yeah, that's good. Brooke, that's good. <laughs> Russ, I can't remember people I met when I was 10. I don't know how you do that. I think I was 11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a long time ago. I met him more as an oat breeder than, I, than, than as a barley breeder. Although mm. we were both oat and barley breeders, he was more of a oat breeder than a barley breeder. Well, um, I'll get this show on the road. I'm substituting for Ryan today. My name is Brooke, if you don't know me. And we have on tap a pre-recorded video between Ryan Hamilton and Mark Sorrells at Cornell, who is a breeder there. And I, by the looks of it, I haven't watched this whole video myself, but it looks like it's about a half hour um, conversation slash presentation. And then after that's over, we will engage in any conversation around the topic that um, seems relevant uh, or anything else. And uh, unfortunately, um, Mark couldn't be here, so we can't ask him questions directly, although I would wager that we could fill his email inbox with questions if we decided we had had things we needed to know. So with that, I will work on getting this video started. Feel free to grab your drink of choice in the meantime or during. And if anybody has any questions or thoughts mid video, uh, go ahead and type it into the chat. Uh, we can we can talk there along the way. All right, can you see the video? Yep. Okay, here it goes. Hi, I'm here with Dr. Mark Sorrells of Cornell University. He's professor of plant breeding and genetics. And he, today he'll be presenting about um, two row malting barley variety they've developed at Cornell called Excelsior Gold and then the future of uh, malting barley breeding for the state of New York. Mark, uh, thanks for being here and take it away. Thanks a lot, Ryan. I'm glad to uh, have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our malting barley breeding work at Cornell. Um, this is a, a relatively recent uh, breeding project that we started about, about six, seven years ago with funding from New York State uh, Ag and Markets. I'm um, just going to uh, share my screen 
and uh, go through a, a, a few slides that will update everyone on on our, our program. So let's see here, share screen and And I hope uh, that you can see my slide. Yep, I see it. Okay, good. Well, um, like any uh, breeding program, uh, it's not a one one horse uh, uh, team. It takes it takes a, a, a lot of people to um, develop a new uh, variety of any any uh, crop. Uh, the principal uh, person on this project was my graduate student, Dan Sweeney. And we also had um, two other graduate students that helped with parts of the project, Travis Rooney and Carl Kunze. Uh, my technicians uh, that have been working for me for many years are David Bencher, Amy Fox, and James Tanaka. Well, um, when we first uh, started our malting barley testing program uh, back about, oh, about 2014 or 15, we uh, tested these varieties that we acquired from all over the world. And uh, some of them from, were from Europe, some from uh, Canada, some from Western US. And uh, we, what we discovered was that even though we could find some that we could grow here in New York, uh, that we found that it was going to be difficult to find a variety, uh, that, uh, an existing variety that actually was well enough adapted that there weren't some problems from year to year. And so what we decided to do was, uh, was start uh, our own malting barley breeding program. And that was initiated in the spring of 2016. We knew that we didn't have a lot of time to come up with a new variety. And so we uh, implemented a breeding program using all of the best technology, winter nurseries and uh, other uh, strategies that we could come up with to develop a variety in the shortest amount of time. And uh, from that start in the spring of 2016, we put out over a thousand lines in 2017 um, we sent material to New Zealand for a winter nursery. And in 2018, we brought back 100 of the very best lines to test in five locations. And then uh, we again sent material to New Zealand. And, and in 2019, we were able to test 60 lines in five locations. And then finally last year, we grew foundation seed of uh, our best lines that we identified from those regional trials. And this year we'll be produ producing certified seed and conducting on-farm trials of 22 of the best lines in four locations. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, we added uh, 22 of, of those lines that came back from New Zealand to our regional trials and compared to the the test in the testing, we compared them to the best uh, varieties that we had obtained from other locations, AAC Synergy, KWS Tinka, and Newdale. Um, we, we were only able to grow those in three locations in 2020, and that was because of COVID restrictions on uh, that prevented us from hiring summer help. Um, but we took them all, we took the, we, we took samples from the top lines and sent those, those to Hartwick for a malt testing. And that was uh, last year was the year we initiated foundation seed production of CU31, which became Excelsior Gold, and another prominent uh, candidate, uh, CU198. So a little bit about CU31, which became Excelsior Gold. Its yield is very similar to AAC Synergy, which is, which is the best variety currently adapted to New York and Newdale. Both of those are Canadian varieties. It's a little bit earlier flowering, has great foliar and FHB, fusarium head blight resistance. And most importantly for our region, it has resistance to pre-harvest sprouting. 
and uh, and that means that it has seed dormancy at harvest time. And of course, this is going to concern um, maltsters who need to uh, be able to malt this variety in a short period of time. So we've tested it for the length of its seed dormancy period, and it appears to be quite short. So it should be suitable for malting within a few months after harvest. Um, and the Harwick uh, malting results show that it has good malting quality. Just highlighted uh, three the three lines here that we um, uh, are using in, a, in a trials. AAC Synergy and New Dale are checks, and uh, CU31 shown at the near the bottom there. And you can see that the statistics on CU31 match up very well with New Dale and Synergy. It is a little taller, and there's a good reason for that. Um, the very short European varieties have problems with the spike sticking in the boot. That means that the, the spike won't come out of the boot very readily. So it's important that we have a little bit taller plant so that that spike can come out of the boot. Uh, it's mostly a problem under stress conditions, but of course we have a lot of that in the Northeast, right? Um, so uh, you can see the PHS score is lower than the other two, which is good and its FHB score is quite a lot lower. It also has surprisingly good spot blotch resistance. Okay, um, this shows a summary of the two years of malt quality that we have on, on Excelsior Gold. Um, its protein is just a tad higher than Synergy. It has a good malt extract. It's one defect is that it has higher than uh, average beta-glucan, um, but with more modification, that shouldn't be too much of a problem in the malt house. Soluble protein is normal. Soluble over total protein is normal. It has uh, acceptable fan actually being better than Synergy. Um, and the diastatic power is good and, and alpha amylase is good. So. Overall, except for the beta-glucan, it's quite good quality statistics. So what's the future hold for malting barley breeding at Cornell? Well, I mentioned earlier, I mentioned CU198. This is another variety. It's about a year or two behind Excelsior Gold in terms of seed production, but it has very good yield and test weight, moderate resistance to spot blotch and fusarium head blight, good sprouting resistance, um, short seed dormancy and earlier flowering time and its quality is actually even better than, than Excelsior Gold. So we're looking forward to moving this, this uh, line along and, and uh, hopefully we'll see that in production in the next uh, year or two. We have other malting barley breeding projects going on. Um, we're working with the USDA uh, Malting Quality Laboratory. Uh, the uh, director there is Jason Walling. And we're working with them on malting quality and how we can combine seed dormancy with good malt quality. We are, uh, in, in addition to the spring malting barley program, we've initiated a, a winter malting barley breeding program because the winter malting barley, if, you can, if it survives the winter, can yield 20 to 30% more than spring barley. And we initiated that winter malting barley breeding in 2017. Again, we're taking uh, advantage of the latest technology to develop a new variety in the shortest amount of time possible. And in uh, we, this past fall, we planted our first yield trials of our doubled haploid winter malting barley lines. And so this will be the first year we'll, we'll get a good look at some of these uh, new winter malting barley breeding lines. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on the winter malting barley trials, but in the winter malting barley, KWS Scala is uh, currently our most popular variety. Uh, Flavia is a promising variety from Europe, but I wanna highlight a new variety called Lightning. This variety was developed at Oregon State University and we participated in its testing. And um, 
So they allowed us to co-release this in a crop registration article. Lightning is unusual in that it can be planted either in the winter or the, or the spring. Its performance is a bit better when it's planted in the fall, but, but this variety has excellent malting quality, uh, acceptable yield, not quite as high as some of the uh, highest yielding ones, but it's better than Scala. And it also has good winter survival, uh, which is a bit surprising for, for this facultative type of win, uh, winter barley breeding line. Um, good skull resistance, good sprouting resistance. Uh, okay, average on, on uh, Fusarium head blight. And uh, uh, we think that this variety has great potential for uh, production in the Northeastern US. Overall, its quality is acceptable, and you see it highlighted in the green. It has uh, uh, average protein, good malt extract, uh, acceptable beta-glucan, uh, good fan, uh, free amino nitrogen, and good diastatic power. So in the future for the winter malting barley breeding, we um, are going to continue to promote lightning uh, because it's available now. Uh, and then we're going to continue testing our winter malting barley double haploid lines with a potential release uh, in 2024 or 2025. I'll just wrap up here with some acknowledgements. Uh, we've been supported most uh, generously by New York State Ag and Markets. We've also had funding from the Brewers Association, the American Malting Barley Association, USDA, the Center for Technology Licensing at Cornell, Genesee uh, Valley Regional Market Authority, and USDA Federal Capacity Funds. So that wraps that up. Um, and um, I'm just going to uh, stop sharing. And uh, you can ask me any questions that, might, that you might have. Uh, see if I can figure out how to get back here. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the facultative barley is very, very interesting. And yeah, that was showing some some good statistics on that, on uh, yeah. lightning. It's very exciting. Uh, yeah, it's it's a very unusual variety, and uh, I think it has a lot of promise for the Northeast. Yeah. Um, so in Michigan, we see um, a significant uh, increase in yield um, comparing winter barley to uh, spring barley as well. But um, we lie a little bit further north in New York too. So as you move farther north in Michigan, um, winter barley survival rates are, are pretty low, uh, depending on the year and depending on microclimate and everything. But since we have two peninsulas, it's really two distinct states if you want to look at it that way. Oh yeah, you have a lot of variation in your climate in Michigan, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, we like it a lot, but it's not so great for uh, for crops all the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, my first question is um, about LCS Odyssey. And uh, so we yearly we do spring and winter malting barley variety trials. And uh, I think three to four years ago, Odyssey was identified as a good candidate for recommended. Um, yeah. A variety to plant in Michigan for growers for optimal success. And what we've seen in the variety trials since then is there really hasn't been many lines that present themselves in variety trials as good substitutes or um, improved varieties to recommend over Odyssey. So that's good. It means the variety trials are doing their job and Odyssey is a nice secure recommendation for us. Um, but everything I've heard from New York, particularly from Aaron McLeod at Hartwick, is that LCS is, or Odyssey is not a good option for New York and doesn't perform well out there. Um, so what do you think might uh, be some explanatory factors into why that would be? Well, that's a good question, Ryan. And it's it strikes at the heart of, of uh, the frustration of many plant breeders. And we call it genotype by environment interaction, which just means that the same varieties don't perform the same in different environments. It just means that there's some varieties that perform well in one location or one state, but not so well in another state. Uh, and this, this, uh, this is a frustration for plant breeders because 
that makes it difficult to predict uh, performance of varieties in other in other climates and other other regions. So, yes, we did test uh, Odyssey. Uh, I believe three years we we tested it for two years. They pulled it out, and then uh, a year or two later they put it back in, and it pretty much tanked every time. I don't I can't explain it, but it, they do have some good varieties. Um, one that is doing pretty well now is LCS Opera. And that's been in for a couple of years now, and uh, it's not at the top of the of the trials, but it's it's uh, acceptable. Yeah, we've um, we've had opera, I think, for two years now, maybe only one, in our um, spring barley variety trials, and it seems to perform well, but not not that much better than Odyssey to really throw that baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, um, and. There's Aaron McLeod is famous for to me anyway for not always telling me not to always pursue the next variety and move on and keep moving like that. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's better to stick with something and build experience and uh, and just go with what you know in that way. Um, but yeah, we like Odyssey's performance here. Yeah, in Michigan, we tend to think, or at least I tend to view it in this way, like New York's very similar, you're bordering Great Lakes. Uh, we both have abundant moisture um, and fusarium problems and, and all that. So there's a lot of similarities there, but I think underlying that there's a lot of dissimilarities that make our, our regions very different. I think um, you pointed out in an email that we have different, very different soil uh, for one thing. You sure do. Your soils are so, are so much better than ours for, especially for dr the drainage. Um, and <laughs> I mean, that's important, right? Yeah. Um, barley is really a, a dry, a, a dry climate uh, crop, and trying to grow it in the Northeast is is a is a big problem for some of those varieties that were that were developed to be adapted to the Western U.S. and Western Canada. So um, it's no surprise to me that that uh, when you transplant varieties from other regions, you're going to run into uh, some unpredictable problems. Yeah, yeah, we don't have much in the way of rocky soil here that I'm aware of, maybe up in the UP, but um, it's interesting too that uh, Synergy and New Dale perform really well and if you're going to use them as checks, like they must perform consistently well and very stable in New York. And uh, we've had success with Synergy in Newdale here, uh, but it's really been limited to one specific location, one specific grower even, because we don't have that many in Michigan. Yeah. Uh, folks are growing probably year after year. Same and, in New York. Uh, yeah. Um, and it's it's one of those things on paper, it doesn't look like it, it looks really risky on paper in Michigan. Uh, but this one particular guy's just knocked it out of the park a few years in a row with Synergy in Newdale one year. Um, but, and at first I was like, well, he just got lucky, but no, I think it's good management and he knows his land and he knows how to pick a variety. Um, but if a grower on the coast of Lake Michigan um, was to ask me what I thought about him growing synergy, I would probably say it's pretty risky. Um, we had one grower out there in a place called Free Soil, great name for a town. Um, who planted uh, ND Genesis two years in a row, and it was just a complete failure. Uh, it was sprouted to all get out, and uh, yeah, it was pretty much food for fungi at that point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but just interesting because, you know, you guys get a lot of snow, and New York doesn't seem that much different to Michigan to me when I go there in my car. But interesting stuff. Um, one, one of the things about uh, Synergy in uh, Newdale that I'd like to point out is their extreme sensitivity to moisture. Um, and it, it, one farmer said, you can just spit on Synergy and it'll sprout. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's true, that it, it is incredibly sensitive to any kind of moisture at harvest time. Um, and, and of course, in, in our region, that's a, that's a major problem for farmers because they can't always get in the field uh, when, uh, when the crop gets down to 18% moisture, you got to get it out of there. Yeah, that's another reason that uh, a lot of growers here favor winter barley um, if they're mm -hmm. able to do it, uh, because timing with uh, wheat works out a lot better. Um, 
yeah, a lot of times the folks here will go for, if it's time to harvest the wheat, they'll harvest the wheat and then consider doing the barley afterwards if it comes to that, just because of the way the market is. Um, but um, yeah, uh, my next question. So in terms of uh, malt quality and grain quality, uh, are there existing varieties that Excelsior Gold is most closely aligned with? And then I have a, um, I'm gonna share my screen here a second. Um, oh, did I? oh, that's strange. Well, yeah, um, looks like uh, my screen sharing is disabled right now, so I can't show the cluster plot. Um, but um, I don't know if you have it up okay. there. I can make sure. I'm going to, I'm going to make you a host now. <laughs> so Thanks. that you can share. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I'm still not quite uh, a master oh, of zoom. Yeah, there it is. So this is a really nice cluster plot that um, Rich Horsley, uh, the barley breeder at North Dakota State University, whipped up for our conference two years ago, um, the Great Lakes Hop and Barley Conference. And it shows, uh, based on agronomic and malt quality traits, um, how the different varieties that we've looked at in um, uniform trials here in Michigan are related to one another. Um, and you can see in that red circle, um, there's some varieties that we know work well, LCS Odyssey um, and Genie to a lesser extent, and then some varieties that are good candidates um, based on these relationships. So I'll, I'll reiterate my question. So where would Excelsior Gold fall on that cluster plot? And um, yeah, I guess that's basically it. Two questions rolled into one. Yeah, well, the pedigree of Excelsior Gold is AAC Synergy crossed to a Montana variety called Kraft. And um, so it's obviously gonna be uh, similar to AAC Synergy but Kraft is uh, a cross between some Western um, malting barley varieties. And so I would expect that it's gonna be in the lower, uh, in the lower third or lower quarter of that red circle. It's gonna be above AAC Synergy because it's gonna be some, have some similarities to the AC, LCS varieties. And, um, uh, so I would I would suspect it'll be inside that red circle just above AAC synergy. That'd be my my prediction. Um, it would be interesting to see uh, uh, what Rich uh, comes up with if we included that in the, that data in in his uh, data file. Yeah, and actually, we could probably work that out fairly easily um, at some point here in the future. Um, well, my next question is, uh, and I think you kind of already covered it in the, in the presentation, but um, what trends are you seeing in New York related to spring versus winter barley, um, both related to agronomic and quality? We talked a bit about yield, um, and I spoke a little bit about harvest timing here in uh, cropping systems in Michigan. Um, but yeah, are there any observations you have uh, outside of that? Right. Yes, uh, we are seeing some trends towards more, more people growing winter malting barley varieties, um, primarily KWS Scala, and that's because of the higher yield. But also, like you, just like in Michigan, the harvest comes off in early July, so that makes it um, uh, convenient because their combines are going to be ready to go when the wheat crop is ready to harvest in, in mid to late July. Uh, so that's that's one big. Uh, uh, plus factor. Early on, in terms of quality, we found that the spring barleys tended to be too high in protein content, or at least on the high side, whereas the winter malting barley varieties tended to be on the low side. And um, with some adjustments in management practices, the uh, farmers growing winter, winter malting barley are now able to produce um, grain that has um, sufficiently high protein to be good good for malting. Uh, so uh, 
we, we're seeing a, a trend towards more winter malting barley and better management. Nice. Um, yeah, we you hinted at this, but we have a similar dynamic here in Michigan where um, most of the time with winter two rows, it's a struggle to get that protein up where you need it to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it varies year to year, but with spring barley, it's the complete opposite where you got to yeah. You got to really walk that razor's edge to keep it down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, interesting stuff. Yeah, it, it was surprising to me the first time I ever worked with winter barley um, when I was in the malt house. It was a completely different animal, quote unquote, <laughs> than spring barley coming in. Uh, it was, Which it was is one nice of the surprise. problems. What's that? Which is one of the problems, of course, for malt houses because um, there's variation year to year, but also from farm to farm. And of course, a huge difference in whether they're malting spring or winter uh, barley. So um, these malt houses have their work cut out for them. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, they're used to it. It seems like every step when I was in the malt house was a, a fight and a struggle and very rewarding when, <laughs> once you get over those mountains. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's not easy work, um, you know, physically and mentally. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a hard road for a lot of craft maltsters out there. Um, so we've touched a bit on whether or not Excelsior Gold would be adapted well to Michigan, and that's just something we'd have to to actually do it to find out. Yeah. But uh, are you in the process of or plan to be um, um, entering Excelsior Gold into AMBA testing, American Malting Barley Association uh, testing for approval? Well, eventually down the road, um, that's going to require a lot of grain. And um, at this point in time, we don't have the resources or the grain uh, to be able to enter it into those pilot scale testing program and that uh, pilot scale testing program, but um, not ruling it out for the future. Uh, this is this variety was specifically developed for the craft brewing industry. So it's not as important for this for for the for this variety to be tested in the pilot scale malting trials because that's more targeting the multinationals like Anheuser Busch and Miller and and uh, uh, some some of the larger brew houses. Uh, it's more uh, uh, adapted to uh, local craft uh, mal uh, craft malting and brewing. And so what's important is that it have good craft malting quality and adaptation to a particular region in which it's grown. That's far more important than, than uh, whether uh, Anheuser-Busch or some of these multinationals would want this variety in their, in their production plants. But um, so we're really more focused on, on local and um, adaptation and uh, acceptable quality for the craft industry. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it makes a lot of sense. I only ask because um, in some cases um, it makes it uh, easier, I guess you could say, to uh, obtain crop insurance or at least um, better coverage for malting barley prices for your barley crop if it is on the approved list. Uh, like mm -hmm. Puffin, for example, um, was recently put back or put on there for the first time, even though it's a rather old variety, yeah. um, just for ins insurance purposes. But yeah, I think um, pilot scale testing for AMBA requires at least one rail car, something like that. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, It's it, there's a lot of logistics involved. And, and remember, we're only uh, at the stage where we're producing certified seeds. So um, we need every every last kernel we can get. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I think that uh, wraps up my questions. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. And uh, is there anything else you'd like us to know about uh, New York Craft uh, Malting, um, Excelsior Gold, and anything at all? Well, I just uh, want to wrap up by thanking the farmers that allow us to test our varieties on their farms. And especially I want to thank New York State Ag and Markets. They've been, they have been the driving force in getting 
and uh, getting a, a new variety out there to the, the farmers and uh, to the maltsters and the brewers is in the shortest amount of time. Without their support, we wouldn't have a, a new variety yet. Awesome. Um, yeah, good things coming out of New York and uh, very exciting stuff coming out of uh, your lab for sure. Um, thanks a lot. Oh, one other thing I was going to mention, we are entering it into the East, um, Eastern Spring Barley testing program that Rich Horsley uh, coordinates. Mm -hmm. So it will be tested fairly widely in the East. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we have three ESBN sites here, so we might see it here. That'd be pretty good. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you. See you, Ryan. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, that's a first for me to um, show a recorded presentation, a Zoom of a Zoom. <laughs> but um, I figured the way we could move forward is I'm sure those of you that watched have questions that you would like to ask Mark, and though he's not here, um, I would pose that you go ahead and throw out those ideas or questions, and then we can discuss as as the small group that we have here, if you've got any. I'd be interested in the genetics of the facultate of uh, spring winter thing. Yeah, so Russ, were you involved in doing any of those crosses trying to develop facultative varieties? No, no, no. Uh, I know they've been doing a little bit with wheat, but uh, I never got into that. I, I'm not sure what the genetics is of, of that. I, I think I can Google it and probably find out. I know that in Australia, it's a fairly common target to grow facultative varieties, but I think it's typically in climates that are a little bit more mild in the winter because, you know, obviously you have to have that variety survive over the winter and then Essentially, I mean, essentially, it's a spring barley that has enough winter hardiness to survive the winter, right? Yeah, and no, I, I, I just don't. I, I think it's the the winter hardiness of the facultatives are, I think, are not that good. I mean, I'd be very suspect. Yeah. Of that, because it's you know that isn't what they were evolved to be. So uh, that'd be interesting. You know, I'm. I, I know you can do the. Like photo, you know, you can have uh, the uh, male sterility with photo period, and that's how the Chinese have their two two line uh, hybrids. They they have one that they use for a a male. Uh, they they use as female, and then they can increase it in, in a different photo period, so they don't need to restore to to deal with that one. But I've, I've, I'm not that familiar with the facultative stuff, so. Well, I will follow up with Mark and see if I can get a, an idea on that topic for sure. Um, the other thing on this breeding program, you know, a lot of people use double haploids, but I was, I was never a fan of that because, you know, you just have the recombination one time. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that the more recombinations you have, the better chances you're going to have at the end to have a, a, a good variety. Now, if you're crossing like two good varieties, which Mark is crossing, you know, then the probabilities are higher on uh, to get double haploids. But uh, in many of the, if you're not, if you're not crossing two elite lines, double haploids are not, uh, not a good way to go. How much, what's the speed at which you can increase the, you know, from, well, from cross to, or is it just a chance, just a chance that you're well, going to you, get? You, you, you stabilize the line right away. So, you know, when, when you grow it the first time, it's going to be uh, stable. So mm -hmm. you have to go five generations to come out with, with uh, a stable line. So it, it just, you know, if it, if you're doing a, two seasons a, a year, that's that's two years that you knock out. Gotcha. 
it's for four generations that you can uh, speed it up. You know, you yeah. don't have to do the the, the four uh, generations, but at the same time, then you don't have the recombination the recombinations in those. So you know, you, it can improve even further uh, the second time. So in this case, they're racing to try to get a variety that's suited to New York's climate and so forth because of the uh, government um, pressure and, and, well, not pressure, but incentives for their industry, I think is what happened there. And it just speeds it up. Yeah. It up, so I know that um, speaking of the lightning variety, I would be interested to hear the story from either Mark or Pat Hayes about how they named them because there's a winter barley that's called Thunder that was recently huh. released as well. And so oh, that'd be <laughs> thunder and lightning. You ought to make a cross between thunder and lightning and see what you come out with. Maybe the big boom. Maybe I bet they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, since there's just a small group of us, I'm gonna stop this recording. <laughs>